I got challenged to do something. There has been a lot going on in our world. That's something I shared with my children when I was picking them up from church last night, um, that the things that we had to deal with when I was a teenager is a, is a whole lot different than what is going on right now. Um, there's a lot happening in our world. Every day there's something that's like, whoa. And everything you just can't just confine to an altar and just pray it out. We've got to, we've got to learn what God is saying to us. And so I've been challenged. It's, it's part of my purpose. And, and I'm going to tell you something. What I'm going to start to teach tonight, I was very afraid to do. I was very afraid to do because it's going to open up questions. It's going to open up uncomfortable conversations. I don't want to be the type of, of representative of God that alienates people with the truth. I don't think people have a problem with the truth. I think people have a problem with the delivery. I think if you can deliver the truth in a way that at least they understand it, and that it's not dogmatic, that it's not separatist, that it doesn't make them feel like they're less of people, that they don't have the truth already, then people are able to receive it. You can give me medicine, but if you throw medicine at me, I can't receive it. Amen. And so I want to be smart and wise enough to follow the grace of God that if I have to share the truth with people who don't already know the truth, that I can do it in a way that at least they can respect it if they don't receive it. And so that's challenging. Because the truth, <laughs> the truth hurts, but it also make you free. What I'm teaching, I'm still learning, so I may hiccup a little bit, and that's what I'm gonna call on Pastor Brad to finish my message tonight. Um, he didn't know that, he was looking at his phone. But um, yep, you're gonna help me preach, man of God. Um, we're dealing with a series, and I had no other, okay, so you can't be New Identity Church without talking about identity, right? And right now, people are identifying in so many different ways. Um, when I was growing up, being anything other than heterosexual was taboo. Like it was, shh, you don't say it, they treat you like lepers if you had another identification and things of that nature. Now we've got all kinds of exploration that's going on. And, and it's not just exploratory, people are identifying in multiple ways. And it's, it's, it's to the point where you cannot ignore the elephant in the room. Can't. We have to talk about this, but you can't talk about it from your heterosexual opinion. We have to talk about it from what God has said and what God is saying. And so for the next few days, weeks, I don't know however, because we are New Identity Church. And I want to explain what New Identity means. We, we base that out of 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. That wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. So we're not saying you can develop another identity. We're introducing you to the identity that God already had for you all along. And that it may be new to you, but it's not new to God. I just want to be clear with that, because it's he that's made us and not us ourselves. Um, before we start, we get into the series. We call this series, I Am. Everyone say, I Am, in the room. Okay, say it with confidence. Say, I am. I am. All right, so we're going to talk about the duality of those two words. To me, it's two of the most powerful things I've ever heard. I am. Our goal is to have enlightenment, to understand our journey, and to reach fulfillment. In Jesus' name, amen. I need y'all praying for me. Um, Psalms 139. I want us to turn to Psalms 139, and I want you to hear this, and, and I want you to... to to compare that, if you have that in your phones, if you have that in your Bible, people who are in the room, they brought tablets like the Old Testament, they, 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 they um, took a piece of a rock and they carved in it like Moses. Um, but whatever you use, I don't care what device you use to get the word of the Lord as long as you use it. Amen. So I'm using this phone right now because it's handy. Um, but I want us to turn to Psalms 139. I want to go to verse 13, 13 to 16. I'm going to read the New International Version. I don't care what version you read, as long as you understand the version that you're reading, okay? If you need someone to help you read, we'll have someone to sit alongside you and interpret for you if you need that for a small fee. All right, praise the Lord. I just want to see y'all smile a little bit. But I, I want to use this as a basis 
a declaration over our lives, I want you to highlight it. Um, I will never forget, and I want to shout out my mom. Uh, my mom, Gladys White, if you're watching this, I love you, mom. Um, hopefully you have forgiven me for not getting you an anniversary gift, but I love you. Um, there was a time when I had moved back from college and I was going through a rough season, okay? I had to move back into my parents' house and I was embarrassed. I had no money, I had no prospect for the future or anything like that. I had gone on some job applications and I didn't get any. I got tired of wearing these suits, going to job after job and they're telling me that the spot is already filled. No, you were just saying now hiring, now the spot is filled. And so I'm embarrassed. I don't want to live with my parents. I'm making $200 a week. It's, it's, I was in a low place. And my mom did something awesome for me because she knew she couldn't talk to me at that point. I didn't want to hear any advice. I didn't want to hear any instruction. I need to breathe. When I woke up that morning, she had a note on my door that said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. And I would rehearse that scripture. And as long as I stayed in her house, that scripture remained on the door in the room that I was sleeping in. And I read it over my life. And I continued to make it my confession until I believed that the Lord was going to deliver me out of this. And so as soon as I got married, I fleed, fled, flew out of that. I left clothes there. There's still clothes there at my mom's house. I needed to get out because the Lord had delivered me out of that all. All right. But I thank you, Mom, for setting a, a standard for me to rehearse the word of God over my life. To not just say it when I'm in a company like this, but to grab that scripture and highlight it, put it where I can read it so I can say it even if I don't feel it, even if it doesn't give me any kind of emotion or, or anything like that. The word of the Lord does not need emotion for it to be true. So I rehearsed that scripture over my life. And I want us to take Psalms 139, 13 through 16. I'm going to read the, the New International Version, and I want you to put yourself in this when I read this, okay? This is, this is a powerful song. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Lord, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Amen. I love the word of the Lord. All right. So let's get into it. Let's, let's get into this I am. All right. Um, Josiah and I, we really love Marvel movies. Isn't that true, Josiah? Yeah. Thank you. We love Marvel movies. I mean, going on all of them. The Avengers, uh, Doctor Strange, um, Captain Marvel, the entire Avengers series. I, I went to sleep on one of them, woke up, and I was still in, in, in the situation. Um, whenever I see Thanos, I kind of twitch a little bit because I don't like that, that character at all. I know some people who look like Thanos in the face. That's another story for another day. But I love, Mar you do too? Yeah, yeah. Thick neck. I love Marvel movies. Black, Black Panther is my favorite, of course. Okay, you know, Black, Black Panther. Uh, but, but there's a common theme in these Avengers that they, they are human beings and they try to give them a human story to make them normal, but they have some type of mutant superpower inside of them that they've come to recognize in a space, but not fully. And they don't come into the fullness of it until they learn their origin. They don't come into the fullness of their power until they learn their origin. So I remember, okay, like Black Panther, okay, so remember when he was, when T'Challa, was about to be ordained king in front of the people, right? And so they had the whole ceremony, and they're outside, you know, they're doing you know, the things popping off. And, um, and so what they had was, everyone knew it was a formality because he's the king's son. The king is dead, he's going to take over. All right, he's taking over for T'Chaka, now T'Challa's going to be king in Jesus' name. All right, so this is a beautiful ceremony outside, and they go to each tribe in Wakanda, and say, do you challenge this? Do you challenge this? And none of them challenge this. And we're thinking, all right, we're about to wrap this up. But here comes M'Baku. M'Baku shows up, big, huge, giant, 
leader of this wayward tribe, and he is disgusted with the entire situation. He says, we will not have it all. And he comes to challenge T'Challa for the right to be king of Wakanda. And so they fight. They get into a fight. And M'Baku is handling T'Challa. He is choking him out. And it seems like we're about to get to the end of the movie in the first 30 minutes. Okay, it can't end like this, right? It can't happen. So, so what happens is there's this nice panoramic scene, and you get all of these people who are chanting at T'Challa, and they're chanting at M'Baku, and they're saying, come on, come on, and they're doing this. And then finally, the camera rests on the queen, Juri, T'Challa's mother. And with a smile, she says, arise, my son. You are a king. When she says to him, you are a king, this is the thing he's fighting for. This is the thing he's wrestling for. This is the thing that he's losing about. But she says, you are a king. And hearing identity from the one who created him gave him strength to overcome the battle. He doesn't have the Black Panther power in him. He doesn't have the undecided advantage, but knowing his identity from who created him gave him the power to overcome the obstacle. And then he overthrows M'Baku, right? And now he puts M'Baku in the submission hall, and M'Baku has to tap out, and he becomes king. And it's a common thread in all of the Marvel movies that as soon as they find out who they really are, whom they've always been from the origin, that becomes their superpower. What we'll do now, we'll make all kinds of changes. We'll make lifestyle changes. We'll move to another city. We'll change our hair. I know nothing about that. We'll change our hairstyle, all right? We'll, we'll, we'll do our house and everything. We'll change our friends. We'll change our name on social media accounts to try to give ourselves something new. And none of that tells us who we really are. None of it does. In order for you to find out who you are, who you've always been, and what you're about to be next, it is found in your creator. Now, there's a lot of questions about purpose, right? Does everybody in the room, do you know what your purpose is? Okay, okay so you have to be honest with me. If you, let's just do a nod of your head if you're not necessarily sure about what your purpose is. It's okay, you're in a safe place. They can't see you on the camera anyway, all right? <laughs> If, you, if, you've been, if you've been operating, you know what? We, we find purpose in so many things, right? Um, and you find, you, you'll go through a course in your life, you've been doing this for a certain time, and then time brings about a change, and all of a sudden you can't do that thing anymore, and you reach that kind of, that, that, that gray area, like, ooh, you know, we're about to be empty nesters, praise God. I just said that I, I don't remember life, really, without my children. We're gonna come into a time where our children are gonna be out of our house. And so much of, we, of our life has been created to serve our children now that they're gone, or they're about to go, what's gonna happen? And how, how, do we, how do we live now? Because they don't need us in the space that they needed us before. Our identity can be locked into how we've, how we've served our children. Our identity can be locked into the job that we have. And we saw that in 2020, it can change just like that. We have multi-million dollar jobs go out of business in a matter of weeks because of a shutdown. So what is your identity based on? What is your purpose out of? What, what do you consider purpose to be? I want us to help, uh, well, let me help you with this. I don't know what your purpose is. I can't tell you. I cannot tell you what your purpose is. I really can't, because I didn't create you. So I don't know. Hopefully we can get on this journey where we can discover what purpose is. I will say this, that we all, everyone in this room and everyone who's watching, we all have the same purpose. Every last one of us, we all have the same purpose. We exist for the glory of God. We all have the same purpose. Our purpose is to bring glory to God. Now the pathways to that are different. The skill sets are different. The assignments are different. The chronology is different. But the results still the same. I had this purpose is to bring glory to God. So, I'm gonna ask you, in what we're doing now, what you do on a regular basis and where your life is now, how much of that brings glory to God? This is what I'm asking myself, I'm not trying to be mean. 
all right? Because you can make a wonderful life in the earth without bringing God glory at all. You can live well until the end of your days, and it dies with you. But if purpose is actually, ooh, if purpose is actually fulfilled, purpose will outlast you. Purpose will outlast you. It will live long after you're gone. Most of the New Testament that we read comes from the account of Paul. Paul was not recognized as an apostle in the earth, but his life and his ministry, his journey and his words, his letters, were so profound that we transcribe them to be the voice of God that we learn from in the New Testament. His life speaks well after he's gone. Is that good? Your, life doesn't, your, the, your life's purpose shouldn't stop when you're dead. It should continue on because it's not your purpose by itself. It's God-given. All right, so purpose is not just the thing that you do. Purpose is not just, just this. Or if I ask you, what are you called to do? Or what is your purpose? My purpose is to type. Your purpose is not to type. Right? Um, there's some musicians in the room that know we'll get pigeonholed because of our musical gift that people think that all we can do is music. Music isn't all that we do. There's more to us than this. I always get frustrated when I watch Family Feud. Um, not because I get frustrated because I feel like I can win on the show. I get frustrated when Steve Harvey introduces himself or introduces a new family, and the first thing that he asks them is, what do you do? as if your identity is locked in your vocation. And I see people struggling with coming up with a good answer because they don't want to seem like being a stay-at-home mom is a waste of time. Well, any mothers that are in this room to understand that the greatest call that you can be, <laughs> that you can be, the greatest job on earth is being a mother. Oh my God, mother should get paid. In Jesus' name. Mothers, no, 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 I'm, and I'm not talking about welfare. I'm not talking about, I was not, mother, good mothers should be paid. Our life would not be what it is on the earth without mothers. There you go. Fathers too, I'm a dad. Okay, father, we can get a check too, a piece of chicken. All right, but purpose is what happens after you do what you do. Purpose is the found in the result of your function. Purpose is found in the result of your function. It is not what you do. It's what happens after you do what you do. So no matter what you do, this happens. If I'm doing music, this happens. If I'm teaching, this happens. If I'm doing a podcast, this happens. If I'm having a conversation, this happens. If I'm hosting a show, this happens. If I'm writing a commercial, this happens. This comes out in everything I do. That's how you define purpose. Is that good? Any questions about that? Any disagreement? You can't disagree with me while I'm doing the teaching, right? <laughs> but it's the result. It's not in the what, because the what can always change. The what can always change. You won't do the what forever. But purpose will outlast you. Okay, let's look at this. I want to I want to look at this. The five W's um, in identification. Aristotle perfected this long time ago. Do we know the five W's in identifying a thing? In finding information? Yes. Let's say it aloud. Who, what, when, where, why, and then we add it a six. It's not a W, but it's important. How? Those are the identifying measures to find out what a thing really is, or the purpose behind the thing. Who, what, when, where, and why. This is one thing that I love about God, is that he does not do things in our chronological order. So you could discover your what before you understand your why. You could be in your where and not in your when. You're in the right place but it hasn't been activated yet. And you don't know why, because the who didn't tell you. You can have all the ingredients, knowing who sent you, knowing what you're supposed to do, knowing when and knowing where, but don't know how. Let me ask you in this room, 
I want you all in this room, let's be a little interactive. If we can get a microphone on, on if we can get um, Jalen's microphone on mute there, because um, I want, actually want to get some full firsthand accounts here. I know which one of these six that I struggle with the most. And it's, so much, sometimes it happens in phases. Can we talk about this for a second? Out of identifying purpose, or identifying the will of God for your life, not just as a whole, but for like right now. Because you can know the macro will of God for your life as far as this is what I'm supposed to do as a whole, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do in February. Lord, what am I supposed to do this week? Which one causes you the most, I won't say causes, but which one is the one that you pray about the most? Who? What? When? Where or why? Who, who would say that the what is the thing? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Two. Three. Who, who, who would say, I don't know why I'm here? Two. Who, who, sometimes it changes. You, you're right. Who would say, I don't know where I'm supposed to be? I, I feel like I'm supposed to move. I don't know if I'm supposed to be here in Houston. Who would, who would say, I don't know how to do? Who, who would say, I don't know what, 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 when? I've got an idea, I've got an understanding, but the timing is the thing. Okay, does anybody want to expound on that publicly in front of people? <laughs> I only want to take one, not at all. Don't make me call you. Come on, Jalen, come on up, honey. Yeah, yeah, you come up because the camera's right here. They won't be able to see you. So oh, just come okay. st stand next to me. Which one was the one that you said? Um, I said how. How? Yeah. Okay. So, so explain to me how you, how you got to that point. So the how. Um, overall, I know the calling that God has placed over my life, but I understand that he's very particular, and my fear is often making the wrong step because I don't want to have to, like, almost make him go through trouble to like reroute like wow uh oh you turn because i done did it wrong you know yeah so that's legitimate does anybody else feel that way and if you're watching online it's the same thing i'm just i'm gonna tell you now i deal with all six i deal with all six all six play in my head okay um and at different times i can be confident in some and not as confident in others. If the just are going to live by faith, there has to be a reason, right? And if you know everything, you don't need faith. So I want to absolve you from any shame that you should not be ashamed in not knowing. You should not be ashamed in not knowing. There is no shame in not knowing. The just don't live by what they know. The just live by faith. <clears throat> And if God told you everything that you need to know every single time, even though, yes, the scripture says the spirit of God knows all the deep things. Yes, the deep things of God. I understand that. But he reveals them in time. So you can know everything and not know when. And it's okay. You can know everything and not know why. And it's okay. Uh, I grew up Baptist. They used to sing this song. That we'll understand it better by and by. And I never knew what by and by when, you know, by and by when the morning comes. Okay, what are you saying? What is this underground railroad code that you're giving me? And then I understood that by and by is not when we get to heaven. It's as life goes on. Year by year, we come to understanding if he's going to be a good, good father. Listen, my children are here. I didn't tell them everything they knew in year one. You can't handle this right now. So I will reveal to you as Father God, he will reveal to us as much as our faith can handle at the time. So trust him with the unknowing. You're not out of the will of God when you don't know what the will of God is. You are not out of the will of God when you don't know what the will of God is. As long as you stay after God. Kids, don't quit. Don't quit when you don't know. Don't quit in the deep spaces. You may need to slow down, but don't quit. All right? And God is a good father. He'll reveal everything that we need to know in time. I want you to know this, that our identity 
does not just come from God. It's in God. Our identity doesn't just come from God. It's in God. Is that good? It, it's, okay, if you go to a store and you buy anything from a store, it's now yours. Right? You pay the price for it, you take it out of the store, it's in your possession. It's yours now. Okay? If you go to a dealership, car dealership, you sign the papers, you pay for it, you drive that car off the lot, that car is yours as long as you make the payments. All right? That is your car. All right? Our identity doesn't work that way. We don't get our identity from God and then leave. We don't find our purpose in God and then leave him. It's found in him, and we're going to need him every day of it to fulfill it. We don't fulfill our purpose outside of him. Does that, does that make sense? Okay? And so in order for all of this to work, for the five W's and the H to work, it always, no matter what order you're in, it always goes back to the origin. It goes back to who? Who? The most important part of our journey in faith is who? If there's one thing we have to know, it's who. If we get lost on the what, we have to know who. If we get lost on the why, we have to know who. Everything resets. When I do voice lessons, I do piano lessons. And by the way, I, I do voice and piano lessons. Church can't build itself. Okay, so. But whenever my students get into a, a, a tough spot, and it happens, whenever they get to a tough, a tough spot where they're like, oh, I messed up, I always tell them, let's come back to the beginning. Don't work out, don't start at the place where you messed up. Come back to the beginning. You're going to hear that later because that's a message on repentance because we like to fix what we messed up. But repentance says come back to the beginning. Repent. Return to the original place. Okay. Come back to the beginning, all right? Our beginning is in him. Our beginning wasn't in the hospital where we were born. Our beginning wasn't in our family. Our beginning was in him. So now we have to find out who he is. Can we go to Exodus 3? The Most High God shows himself to us as I am. So in order for me to find out who I am, I have to now go to I am. <laughs> I'm trying to find the best way to, because I want to shout. All right. Exodus 3. This is dealing with Moses. This is, this is Moses the murderer. Moses the man who can't talk. Okay? He's got, he's got a criminal record and an impediment. Okay? A criminal record and an impediment. He's working in Jethro's yard. The Lord appears to him in a burning bush. The bush is not all the way burnt, which is crazy. And he begins to speak to him, tells him to take his shoes off, because where you're standing is holy ground. Moses is going through it right now, okay? No one can see this but Moses. This is crazy. This is like, this is like the first man who heard a parrot talk for the first time. Like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine the first person who heard a parrot talk? Like, uh, that man was not okay. All right, you know, this is... What in the world is going on here? No, Y'all can't hear this kind of, Okay. And Fruit Loops were born. All right, so <laughs> Moses is right here with this burning bush. The Lord is talking to him, and he tells him his plan for the people. In verse 9, I'm reading from the King James Version. He says, Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come upon me, coming to me, and I've also seen the oppression where the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, Moses, come here. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. I need to stop right here, because at this point, from Genesis to Exodus, no person can approach a pharaoh unauthorized. When men or women entreated the presence of a pharaoh, they had to do so by the order of a king or a leader. Okay? We'll come back to the scripture. He says, verse 8, 
Come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you will bring forth my people from the, chil the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses says, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Verse 12, the Lord says, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a sign unto thee that I've sent thee. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve the Lord upon this mountain. Then Moses says unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? Verse 14, God says unto Moses, I am that I am. He said, Thus shall y'all say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Verse 15, God said moreover unto Moses, thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. If you look in the New Living Translation of verse 15, when he says, this is my name forever, the translation when he says, thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh has been sent to you. And Yahweh is his name forever. Everyone say the name Yahweh. Yahweh. Two months ago, we did a, a night of worship and, and, and the revelation of Yahweh came to us that God is. That's what Yahweh means. Yah, God, way, is. Yahweh, God is. And that is my name forever. I am. God is. I am what? I am. No, that's it. God, what are you? I am. Okay, I, I, but what are you? I am. I am that I am. I am who I am. I am. That's the ultimate being, to be. We find our purpose in doing. Our creator is. I am. Now, now, it's natural for us to call ourselves human beings, right? But we feel like being human beings is nebulous with no purpose. Everything that flows out of you flows from existence. You do not have a hollow existence and then you do things to define yourself. You are the house where I am dwells. You were made in his image and in his likeness, okay? Image, likeness, when you think image, likeness, we think face, right? Look around this room, do we all have the same face? No, we got different shades in here, we got different body types in here, we got girdles, we got waist trainers, all right? We got all kinds of things popping up. We can't all look like the image of God, if our bodies were the indicator. If hair was the indicator, I'm not in the will of God. Or Brad. Don't leave me alone in my baldness. Okay? Look at the hairy people. Just gonna, uh, you're just going to throw your hair like that? Somebody... Sin. So you don't have to lose a whole bunch of weight to fit the image of God because you think God is thin. Your body doesn't give you the indicator of what God looks like. His image isn't in our frame. His image is in his essence. It's not in the frame. Our essence breathes the image in the likeness of God. I am. And that is the origin. I am. When he spoke to him and showed him that he was, then he began to do everything that's associated with I am, which means he could do anything. He wasn't limited to a skill set. He wasn't limited to a character trait. He wasn't defined by impediments. I am. What have you talked yourself out of because you didn't think you could? What, what dream came to you? What vision came to you that was out of your pay grade, 
that was out of your education grade, that, was, that you don't have the resources for it, you don't have the connection for it, and you shut it down because you couldn't see yourself. In this entire passage, when Moses was talking to God, Moses tried to give God every excuse as to why he couldn't, because Moses couldn't see himself past his failure. So he got a job to sustain him in the earth because he didn't think he was worthy of being who God made him to be based on his impediments and his sin. The impediments don't get in the way unless we let them. The impediments will be proof that it's God. When you do what God calls you to do and you can't talk, people will know it's God. <laughs> when you start a business and you have no money and the business flourishes, people will know that it's God. Your limitations will be proof that God is when you do what God calls you to do. But you can't do it until you know who I am is in you. If you don't know who I am is in you, you'll look for your friends to tell you who you are. You'll look for your relationships, your spousal relationships. You'll tell your spouse, tell me who I am. And you'll say ignorant stuff that God didn't say, like, I can't breathe without you. <laughs> it's one of the dumbest things you could ever say to another person because the person didn't give you breath. That means you gave them a God space in your world. You can't give another person God space, and if you knew who God was, you'll know how to place people in your life. I'm not going to give you the space that God is supposed to have. I love you a lot, but you didn't create me, and you didn't give me my identity. Marriage doesn't give you identity. Children don't give you identity. Relationships, friendships, status, it does not give you identity. All of that can change. The unchanging one is actually on the inside of you. The I am. What if, how about this, y'all? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. What if God knows everything about you and still calls you? What if he hasn't eliminated anything concerning your life, no matter what you've done? Because he's still in you. And if he's still in you, he still has a plan for you. Everyone say, I am. I, I, I want to get to this because there's a couple of things I have to say here that I am is in you. Make that a declaration. I am, I am. is in me. Okay, y'all are saying that because, it, you know, I told you to say it. It's like, you know, if you're happy, you know it, clap your hands. I want you to receive the revelation that the great I am, as of February 10th, is in you right now. With all of your shortcomings, with all of the things that you need to improve, with all of that, I am is in you now. Someone say, I am, I am is in me. Let's turn to 1 John 4 and 4. I'll read it for you. You are of God, little children, and you've overcome the world. Greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. Do you know that human limitations and worldly pressures are no match for the I am that's inside of you? I'm going to say that again. Human limitations and worldly pressure are no match for the I am inside of you. When you start feeling worthless, when you start feeling helpless, when you start feeling pressured to, to, to act in a way that is unseemly, it's time for you to draw back to where I am is. Go back to the origin. Your strength is in your I am. It's not in your talent. It's not in your gifting. It's not even in your not. You can know what to do and still not do it. Your strength is in your I am. And as simple as this, it's to believe it. It's to believe that I am has chosen you. He's created you in his image and in his likeness. And this is why I thank God for Jesus. 
I thank God for the life of Christ. Because Jesus didn't just come to the earth to save us from sin and death. He came to restore a relationship from I am back to us. If you were just saved in quarantine, you'd have no effectiveness. Jesus didn't just come to the earth for salvation. He came to the earth to establish the kingdom of God. So everything he did on the way to the cross was necessary for the kingdom of God to be established. And then when he got to the cross, he saved us so we could participate in it. So he built the kingdom in every miracle, in every teaching. He was so excited about it that he, he jumped. He knew the why, but jumped the when. So when he, was, <laughs> when he was a teenager, he snuck out of Mary's house and, and went to teaching at the temple, and she went to find him, and he was there teaching. She was like, you need to come home. He says, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? But it wasn't time yet. Because if he announced his, oh my God, I'm going down a rabbit hole. If he would have announced his identity before time, that's, that was, that when you announce your identity as far as who you are, who God made you to be, the clock starts. Because you have a certain amount of time to fulfill your identity. So if he would announce it at 12, he only had three years on the earth after the announcement of the fulfilling of his assignment. So if he would announce it early, he would have died early. And the kingdom of God wouldn't have been established. We just would have been saved and miserable. We would have been saved and no power. We would have been saved with no purpose, just saved and waiting to die. But so he had to wait. Now fast forward to the story where, where they were at the party and they ran out of wine. He's in the back. Now, he's a young adult at this point, right? And they ran out of wine. And Mary calls it to her son Jesus and says, hey, man, why don't you hit that water? And what, did he, what does he tell her? My hour has not yet come. And I'm so glad Mary ignored this. And let me stick a pen right here for everyone who loves that song, Mary, did you know? Obviously, she knew, okay? <laughs> Right. She, she knew her son had water to wine power, okay? So she goes and tells the man, hey, whatever he tells you to do, just go ahead and do it. And the same power, and I'm telling you, the same identifying power where Jesus took water and put water in water pots and made wine with no grapes, that same I am is inside of you. Yes. Same one. So when he came and he lived, and, and every miracle that he did, notice this, his purpose was fulfilled, and he didn't even have to do things for purpose to be fulfilled. When he read the scroll that says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach the gospel, to set at liberty them that are bruised, that means healing, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He didn't even have to do it all the time. When the woman who had the issue of blood grabbed the hem of his garment, he didn't heal her. It was in the hem. She was made whole by her own touch. It was in him. He didn't have to do it. He was it. Okay? When, when the servant, the centurion soldier, came to him and said, my son is sick, and Jesus said, oh, I'll go heal him. He said, you don't even have to come to my house. Speak the word, and my son will live. So it's in my voice, it's in my hand, it's in my robe, because it's in me. Your purpose is in everything that you do when you know who you are. It's in everything you do when you find out who you are. Don't look to, do, don't look to find out what to do next. Find out what to be now. Who am I now? I've done this for years, but who am I now? I have this proclivity, but I don't know what to do, so I need to find out who I am is saying for me to be, because I am is here. John 1 and 12. Let's go to John 1 and 12. Y'all all right? John 1 and 12 says this, and it's talking about Jesus. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. And when you see the word sons, I want to, because I know there's many daughters in the room, amen. Um, and whenever I'm outnumbered by women, I get very afraid. It, there was a thing that happened in 1994. We don't need to talk about it right now, but I'm deathly afraid of women. So, why are you laughing? Why are you laughing about that, okay? Right, women intimidate me. I got beat up with some purses at a movie because I, I laughed too loud 
at the Tina Turner movie, there was a scene in there that, and I laughed, and and um, they beat me right up out of that that theater, and um, and I laughed in the car. Um, but ever ever since then, I twitch when I'm outnumbered by women. Um, but I'm in a safe place tonight. Praise the Lord. She said, "You may be in a safe place tonight." Okay, now I'm back to twitch. Let me finish. So, when you see the word "son," it is not just talking about males. When you see sonship, it is not just talking about males. When you see man, it is not just talking about men. It is talking about mankind. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So everything that he created in his image and in his likeness is not limited to gender. All right? Gender is here for earthly identification and covenant purposes. So he specifically made you a female for a reason. He specifically made you a male for the reason. Even if you don't reproduce in the earth, your, your gender is still important to generations. So who you are is still fearfully and wonderfully made as a male and as a female. So your identity is not locked in procreation, all right? We do not have an account that Jesus or Paul had children. Not a real account. We don't have that, all right? But they had life to birth, okay? And so your nurturing nature, your, your, your producing nature is still very important. He made you a male, he made you a female, and birthed you for a specific reason. Praise the Lord. Learn to love the I am inside of you. You are not ugly. God doesn't make ugly. He doesn't like ugly and he doesn't make ugly. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not limited to your anatomical features. You are precious in the sight of the Lord and don't let any other creature tell you otherwise. Praise the Lord. All right. So we're talking about sons of God. If you believe this, he doesn't just give you power to be saved, but to be a son. to be a son, to be a joint heir, to have dominion ability, to have the power and the wherewithal to dominate a space. You have that now. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives you the power to become a son. You're not weak. You're not docile at all. You are powerful. You are a powder keg. There is so much untapped potential inside of you that, just like me, I get, and I can say this in full confidence, God will give me something to do, and I'm so intimidated by it that I don't even touch it. Because it's big. Does anybody, does, does that make sense? Don't, please don't make me feel normal, uh, abnormal. Like, like, it's so heavy what came to me, like, I don't even want to get started on this because it's too big. And that's when you know it's God, when it's going to take more than you to do it. That's when you know what's purpose, when it's bigger than you and it doesn't give you glory at all when you do it. Then it's going to take multiple things to happen and it won't start until you receive that I am worthy of it. You can be humble and still say I am. You can be meek and lowly and still say I am. All right? You don't have to abase yourself. The same Jesus who made of himself of no reputation was the same Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to the Father except by me. The, 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 the same modest Jesus went to that well and told the woman, if, uh, if you knew what you were standing in front of, you'd ask for living water. You can be humble and still know who you are. Humility does not abase your identity. Humility doesn't make you shrink down. You still are who God called you to be. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not saying I'm better than you, but I will be the best me. And so I own everything that God gave me. I own every skill. I own every ability. I own every talent. And I am unashamed of it because he gave it to me. And it would be disrespectful to him to, 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 to abase my gifts in the presence of other people so they can feel better. No, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you receive my purpose, we can both find out how fearfully and wonderfully made we are because the Lord is no respecter of persons. He fearfully and wonderfully made all of us. 
We have different what's, but we have the same why. We have the same why. And there may be some time before you can discover that. There may, there may be a lapse of a period of time where you just, you've been praying and you continue to pray and the God, does, God isn't showing you. I'm going to tell you this, God does not always answer your prayers when you want them to be answered. He's a good father. He's not a genie. You, you don't just rub the lamp of prayer and all of a sudden it pops up three wishes and you, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. I wish it did. It doesn't. But it always works for our good whenever he does answer us. I would be praying, y'all, and I'll be asking God for weeks about something. He'll start talking to me about something else. And I'm like, you know, God, that's not what I asked you at all. I was talking about these bills, okay? And you over here talking to me about, about praying for single mothers. I don't care about these single mothers. I'm just get married, okay? Can you talk to me about these bills? But he's like, no, I want you to pray for three days about single mothers. Why? I'm not single or a mother. Why do you want me to do this? I want you to be conditioned to be I am. That just because you're a man doesn't mean you can't pray for women. You're not limited in ministry based on your gender. Wherever I need you, I am will be there. So he'll disturb my prayer to do something that I haven't done. Because I want God to speak to me based on my comfort. I want God to speak to me based on my gifts and my skill set. Tell me what I'm able to do, that I'm comfortable doing, that I've already been doing, and I want you to breathe through that. And he says, I want to breathe through the uncomfortable part too. The thing you have no experience in, and I want you there. God will tell me, and maybe he's been talking to you about this, God will tell me about stuff, stuff that I will never have anything to do with. He just likes to talk to me. We mentioned this in prayer a couple of weeks ago. We recorded a series on prayer. We said prayer is not prayer if it's one-sided. Prayer is the place where God talks to you and you talk to him. So there's some things God just wants to show you because he loves talking to you. Because when I am talks to I am, things happen. So if, I'm just, if you only respond to God based on the things that you want, then he knows to be limited to you in how he responds to you. Because you ain't even ready for that. I can't even show you things I want to do in the future. I can't show you things I want to do five years from now because all you're thinking about is week to week. I promise you I'll be your present help. I want to show you some great and, great and mighty things that you don't even know yet. Can you avail yourself to, to allow I am to show you something bigger than where you are? So there'll be a time where you're praying for things and it, and it seems like God's not answering. I want to say this to you. I want you to resist the urge to make a permanent decision while you're waiting on God to reveal himself to you. Resist the urge to make a permanent decision while you're waiting on God to reveal himself to you. Wait on the Lord. Well, I need to know what to do now, I'm sure. Wait on the Lord. Trust the Lord with your time. Trust the Lord with your time. What I don't want you to do is start playing God and now all of a sudden you create a circumstance that he's not responsible for. Okay, the, Genesis, go to Genesis um, 16. Genesis 16. Because God can give you a promise and then doesn't say anything to you for like a year and a half. God will give you a promise, don't say anything to you like two years. While you turn into Genesis 16, I'm going to paraphrase this whole thing, but I want you to follow. In Genesis 16, okay, so God had already come to Abram, who, who was going to become Abraham. And he told him he was going to make him a father of many nations. He came to him at 75 years old, okay? He was at 75 years old. Now, Abram was 10 years older than his wife at the time, and his wife was barren. Couldn't bear, couldn't bear children, okay? He said he was going to make Abram a father of many nations. How are you going to make me a father of many nations when I'm old and my wife's womb is dusty? How is that going to happen? I'm sorry. Mine's bad. Seems like impossible, right? To the point that when God told him about Isaac, Abraham actually laughed in God's face. Sarah doesn't believe it either, and you're going to find out here in, in chapter 16. Sarah goes to Abraham says, listen, 
The Lord's not answering. I know what he said, but he hasn't talked to us in a long time. All right? I can't bear children. It's not going to happen. Why don't you take Hagar, the lovely young woman, and lay with her so y'all can have the child that God promised us? Abraham was like, well, I want to be a good husband, so if you say so, honey. Yes. He didn't put up a fight at all. They just went ahead and um, took Hagar. And, um, and as soon as they got down, Sarah hated Hagar. But you were the one who created the circumstance. You were the one who decided not to wait on the Lord and you made the suggestion to your husband to do a thing that was out of the will of God to try to get the will of God accomplished. And then when you saw how beautiful Hagar was to how old you were, her ability to be fertile and you're not, now you hate somebody who was your servant who was just doing what her, her leader said. Hated her, sent her away. Sent her away. The angel of the Lord came to Hagar while she was sent away. This still is, this still is an I am, trust me, we're back. Angel of the Lord comes to Hagar and says, what happened? She said, my, my, well, Sarah sent me away. She hates me. Tell Hagar, go back and serve her. I'm going to be with you. And, and you're, not only am I going to be with you, but you're going to be fruitful in the so many ways that it can't be numbered. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to preserve the child that you're going to have. You didn't ask for this. I'm going to preserve the child that you're going to have. But now, in chapter 17, <laughs> Abram, okay, so Ishmael is the child. Ishmael is the child that is named. This is not Isaac, this is Ishmael that was born from Abram and Hagar. Twelve years have now passed, and the Lord comes back to Abraham and says, I'm going to make you a father of great nations. Still. Even though he tried to play God and create it, and he's got this mess on his hands because He's living with the woman he slept with that his, his wife told him to sleep with, but she hates him. And now they got this child together, and he doesn't have the promise yet. So now Abraham has to manage his own situation while he's waiting on the promise from God. Because God ain't authorized to handle what you create. The promise is still there. Now you got to deal with the promise and your production. <laughs> okay. You got to deal with what God is providing and what you provided for yourself. If you would wait on the Lord, Isaac will come and it would be no problem. I don't want y'all to birth Ishmael's while you're waiting on Isaac. Don't get in the way of God while God is doing because you think it's going to take too long. Because here's what happened. Sarah did give birth when she was 90. 25 years after the promise came. But she still gave birth. And Abraham was a father of many nations. He lived to be uh, uh, hundreds of years old. And God still used him, even though he messed up a whole bunch. I am was still there. He didn't break the promise to him. When we break promises, God doesn't break the promise to us. He's still faithful. And if you would wait on the Lord, I am will show himself strong and mighty to you. There's three things that I want us to pray. I want us to pull those up on the screen if we can. Because it's very, very simple. It's very, very simple. We make this hard. Ask and believe. It's no great big huge hocus pocus thing that happens here. Ask and believe. There's three things that I want us to pray, and I want y'all to repeat after me. Lord, 
please show me who you are. Lord, please show me how to see you in where I am right now. Lord, I receive the grace to become the I am that you've designed in me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I believe tonight, whenever you're watching this online, I believe that 2022 will be a year of clarity for us. That we will have the understanding that we need in every place that we will know who I am really is that we will take him out of a box and we put him into a breath that Yahweh will always speak to us and we will have the confidence that he has made us just like him I am is inside of us we're full of power we're unlimited we're undefeated we're in our 50s, we're in our 60s, we're in our 70s, and we can still do all things. God is not limited to our age. He's not limited to our structure. He's not limited to where we are right now. In us, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask or think according to the power that works inside of us. I receive I am. My identity is not locked into my family. It's not locked into my region. It's not locked into a sexual orientation. It is found in my creator. And there is where I begin. And there is where my power lies. I pray you receive that. Jesus.